Okay, let's continue our discussion of gravitational potential energy by looking at this problem right here. Here we have a guy that's um, maybe a girl, got shorts on but a ponytail, so it could be a guy. We have two two situations. First of all, we have a guy that's carrying this up this television up a set of stairs to a point that's approximately H in height. A second guy is doing the same job, but he's doing it in a different way with a pulley up here. And he's moving this from the bottom, and he's going in the same direction. So what this is supposed to show is that the path that the person gets the television from the ground to point B up here, this, this level, doesn't really matter. This is path independent because the calculation of delta PE G is MGH regardless of how it gets there. Gravity is the same. The work that's done to get it up there is the same. The mass is the same. And so essentially you, you have no difference. And so the path doesn't matter. And that's the whole point here is it doesn't matter how you get from point A to point B. The gravitational, the change in gravitational potential energy is the same as long as your baseline is the same and your final point is the same. So if a 60 kilogram man jumps onto the floor of three millimeters, three meters below him, so let's say he's standing here and he jumps from here and say this distance is three meters, almost 10 feet. So he leaps out this, off this ledge and lands stiff-legged so that, that, all the, that what happens is that there's a compression of his, of his knees and that compression represents a change in, of 0.5 centimeters. What is the force that is exerted on his knee joints? Well, again, we did this before, F net, so the work net, not F net, but work net is equal to F net times D cosine theta, where the cosine theta here, the, the two are in the same direction, and so this is going to be cosine of zero or one. So it's basically FD. And since he's going down, so the direction of his fall is down, and the force that stops him is up, it's going to be a negative work. The kinetic energy that, that he generates or is generated by him is going to be equal to a negative change in potential energy. So the only energy that he's going to get from jumping off this is the potential energy change that occurs from going from this point to this point. And since he's going down, it's a negative number. In other words, another way to think about this is the kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy has to be zero. It has to be conserved. And this work, because he ends up going zero, you know, his final velocity is zero. So based on the, the gravitational, or excuse me, the um, work energy theorem, his work is also equal to this minus kinetic energy, which is also equal to the mgh. And so, what, in, what you end, ends up, you can say, is, is that this minus FD is equal to MGH. And you know M, and you know G, and you know H, and you know D. So you know all these things. D is how much his joint is compressed. So the D is brought over here. So you have 60 times 9.8 times 3, because it's 3 meters divided by 0 0.005 centimeters, which is the fall. So the force exerted on his joints is 353,000 newtons, or 3.53 times 10 to the fifth newtons. The stiff-legged part is the, the part that makes this so bad. Imagine if he allowed his knees to bend and the distance goes from, say, 0 0.5 to 5 then you would, you would move this one decimal over and reduce this by a full factor of 10, just by bending your knees a little bit as opposed to landing stiffly. And that's why they tell people to bend your knees when you jump or land like that.
Now it's important to understand that the path independence here, if we start here, we're, we're going to go through this carefully because this is a kind of a tricky problem because at one point your, your potential energy is one thing, but at another point it's another thing. And you have to make sure you know what you're, what you're asking. So you're starting with an initial velocity of zero and you want to know what this final velocity is. And using the work uh, energy theorem and this change in potential energy, you can make a cal you can do this calculation. So let's see how we do this. So what is the final velocity of a roller coaster if it starts from rest at the top of the first hill? Assume no friction. Now notice that I didn't give you a mass, and there's a reason for that, which I'll show you in just a minute. So here's the work energy theorem. The net work is equal to the final velocity squared times mass times one half minus the initial velocity squared times one times one half. Since the initial velocity is zero, you can cancel this factor out and you end up with the net work is equal to one half mv squared. But this is also equal to the change in potential energy. And this is, this, these little bars here mean absolute value, okay? So the change in height is equal to, and it's a negative because your height change is down. And so the change in height times gravity times mass is going to be equal to this change in kinetic energy. So you, you put the change in height absolute value of change in height times gravity times mass is going to equal to one half times m times v squared. Notice the m's are on both sides so you don't need that. You can cancel those two out and if you rearrange this the velocity is equal to the square root of two times g times the change in height. You put the numbers in. You've got 20 here and, and you put 9.8 for gravity and the final velocity is 19.8 meters per second square. Now there are other forms of energy and force that can be conserved and here's an example of of elastic energy. Here's a spring. When the spring is at rest it has no energy and does no work. But when you pull the spring out, it requires a certain force to do that. This zero represents the starting point or resting point, And x represents the change in displacement when you do that. And k is the, what's known as the spring constant. And it's dependent on certain aspects of this spring, like the, what it's made of and how thick these, uh, these coils are, etc. The work that's done to pull this out, if this is the force that's done, the work is, is FD, or FX in this case. So the work is done is one half KX squared. And the potential energy is also one half KX squared. When, when, this is not a constant force. It takes more and more force the more you pull this out. And so it is represented by a straight line. And so the area under this curve is, is the work that's done and the potential elastic energy that's stored here. So there's a conservation of force again that working in, in this situation. The work that done, done by or against this force only depends on the beginning and end state and not the path taken. And that's because of gravity. And the potential energy of a spring, P S potential is P E elastic or, or spring, is the energy that's stored in a spring when it's at any position other than its resting position. So if you pull a spring out to this point and somehow just hold it there, then that's the potential energy of the spring. Here's another example of the same idea, except instead of a spring, we now have a string on a guitar, which is, which is stretched out like this, and you have to exert a certain force to deform this string on this guitar. 
and here's the, the force that's done and the distance is from the resting position to its next position. The work done to deform this guitar string it gives it also a potential energy. When it's re released, the potential energy is then con converted to kinetic energy and the, and the string oscillates. And that's the potential energy that it has. There's a small fraction that is dissipated as sound or sound energy and the rest is dissipated as the string slowly uh, decreases its motion. So part of the energy that comes from you pulling this out is actually what produces the sound that we hear. Again, the, the formula is the same. The kinetic energy that's, that's exerted, I'm sorry, the potential energy that's, ex that's put into the string by pulling it out is converted to kinetic energy when the string is released. The sum of these two is equal to a constant and that constant represents the sound energy that's released. Another way to look at this is to, sh to say that the kinetic energy of any object at its initial state plus the potential energy of any object in its initial state is equal to the kinetic energy of the object in its final state and the potential energy in its final state and that is a, another way of stating the conservation of energy if all the energy that's involved is either kinetic or potential. So here's a situation where we're looking at the conservation of mechanical energy. We're starting with a spring that rockets this little car and the car can either go up this way and end up here or the car can take this path do a loop-de-loop -loop and end up in the same point. So you have two different paths, the same situation. So you have a one-tenth kilogram car that's propelled by a compressed spring and it follows the track that rises to this point that's 0.18 meters above the starting point. If this spring is compressed four centimeters and has a spring constant, of 250 newtons per meter, how fast is the car going before it starts up the slope? So how fast is it going at this point? And how fast is it going up here? So it'll have an, an initial an, a velocity here, which if there's no friction, it'll be the same. And it'll have a velocity up here. And then which path results in the highest speed at the end? So let's take a look first at how we would do this this way. Well, the kinetic energy that the car achieves comes from the spring. And the spring energy is one half of the spring constant times the displacement of the spring squared. So the, the final velocity at this point here is going to equal the spring constant divided by the mass of the car times the distance that the spring was displaced and the square root of that. So that's just rearranging this. The halves cancel out. If you rearrange this and then take the square root, you'll get, you'll get this. So if you put the numbers in here, as I've done here, you get two meters per second squared. So that's the velocity before it goes up the slope. Now, that's its initial velocity. Its final velocity is going to be equal to, this is all the energy it has when it's at this point. When it gets up here, it has two forms of energy. It has now potential energy as well as the final kinetic energy. And that's represented by these two factors right here. Here's the final kinetic energy that it has and the MGH so part of the initial kinetic energy that it has before it starts up the slope is consumed taking it up the hill. And if you substitute, you notice there's M's all the way across here, so you can cancel these M's out. And you end up with this formula right here. If you rearrange it and solve for this, you ultimately get 0.67 or 0.687 meters per second squared.
So it starts out at two meters per second squared and ends up at six point or point six eight seven meters per second squared. Now the answer to the last question here is because the, this is path independent. So the velocity here is two meters per second squared and the velocity here is 0.687 meters per second squared even if it takes this path doing it. 